Welcome to the Possibility Action Network podcast. I'm your host, Stephen Middleton, a.k.a. Possibility Man. We're committed to bringing you guests who strive to better people's lives and serve as a force for good in the world. Our guest today is James Stanton Jr. He's a founding partner of Top Flight Foundation. Top Flight teaches individuals about earning and saving money. They also share their insights with individuals about creating a financial legacy for their heirs. Top Flight also mentor, mentors business owners and empowers them to excel in their endeavors. James himself is a consultant, entrepreneur, and a prominent public speaker. James Stanton Jr., welcome to the show today. Thank you. Glad to be with you this morning. Okay, great. I want to remind our audience to follow, like, and share this podcast wherever you find it. Your support matters because the more subscribers we have, the bigger guests like Mr. Stanton will be able to draw to this podcast. Look, James, I'm just excited to talk with you because you have an interesting background and you have grown over the years to do some amazing things. So would you give us a glimpse into your background? Where did James Stanton Jr. come from? I, I come from Duquesne, Pennsylvania, which is a small town um, about 20 miles south of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. My dad uh, left North Carolina as a sharecropper and got a job in the steel mills. And uh, I and my eight brothers and sisters were raised, educated in Duquesne, Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. Duquesne. Uh big fort back traces back to the American Revolution was there, a very historic city. So James, I know that you, you know, you got into business early on, but I want you to think, I want you to think with me about goal setting. When did you first learn about that? When you, would you begin to, to apply goal setting to your work as a business owner? Well, it started off early on. I, I, uh, my dad was a very driven individual. Um, he only had three years of education, my mother, four years of education. And he had a very clear vision uh, of what it was that he wanted to accomplish in life. So I modeled after him. So my first business was shining shoes. Um, mm. We didn't have a lot of money, um, didn't have an allowance. People asked me what my allowance was. I said, well, I was allowed to stay there. So <laughs> <laughs> we, we had to go out and hustle. So I went out and collected pop bottles and got enough money to uh, buy shoe paste and then, um, uh, my brother and I, we both made ourselves some shoe stands and we went downtown uh, around the banks and we shined shoes, 25 cents a shine. Um, and from there, I learned how to manage money and how to save money. And then my brother had a, uh, a morning paper route and uh, he left at 18. So at 13, I took that. And, and again, I'm learning how to manage money, how to collect the money, how to service customers and saved up my money and then bought a bike, which made me more efficient. And I did that business until I graduated high school. So I was always goal oriented and knew how to, to manage money in order to control my life. Mm -hmm. So you've just indicated that, you know, you needed to start do something to earn money. Um, but was it was there more than necessity? Was there also was there an inner spark or something that you felt about business early on? Well, I, I used to um, I used to watch the Doris Day and Rock Hudson movies, and um, he would come into the country club. They knew him. He had his his seat, and they knew his wife. His wife would come in, and he'd give her money, and she'd go shopping. And I said, "That's that's the lifestyle that I want." Um, uh, I didn't see color. It, it didn't dawn on me that that this there was just white people doing this. These were just successful people. And so that's the, that's the lifestyle that I want. And that's, that was my motivation to be able to live as a successful business person. Now, you, you mentioned that you were, you know, you were a business owner in a sense when you were a kid, shining shoes. When did you begin to think about business and let's say capitalism? And what is your impression of capitalism? Well, I, I early on, I learned that I heard of the golden rule and it was different from what my perception was, but I had a person, a businessman tell me, he says, the person, he who has the gold makes the rules. Mm. 
And so business people have the goal and they in turn are able to make the rules and set up the environment for which we function. So capitalism is the most successful means of running human, uh, human beings. Uh, the, the, you might say the, the high point of America and why everybody wants to come to America is that America has the largest middle class in the world. Uh, everywhere else over human history, you got the super rich and there's very little in between and everybody else is poor. So here in America, where you can take your resources, your abilities, and you can provide a service that someone is willing to pay for on a sustainable basis, then you have capital. Capital allows you to make the rules for which your lifestyle will be supported. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, I think I've, I've heard you say something or written something about capitalism and inclusive competition. If I got that right, what do you mean by that? Well, that's what I call inclusive competitiveness. Mm. And so I think the best example would be if you take a look at, at professional sports, football, basketball, baseball, all these sports were segregated. And so it was limited as, limited as to who could participate. Once you take down that elimination as to who could participate, and everybody has equal access and the rules are applied evenly to everybody. Now each individual can compete for the limited number of jobs, right? So if you look at that and you look at now, once you take away and you open the gate up and everybody has an opportunity to participate, everybody has an opportunity to compete and then you go with the best competitor. So. It is inclusive of everybody. Everybody has the same opportunity to compete and then let the best person win. So mm -hmm. that's, if you take that application and spread that out throughout, throughout life, if you will, then what you want is equal access under the law. You have metrics, the metrics are evenly applied and everyone has an opportunity to compete and that in turn brings out the best of your entire population and everybody wins. Mm -hmm. Sounds like you're not afraid of competition, of competing. Uh, I, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> I played on, uh, I was on an undefeated team, football team in junior high. That same group of guys were undefeated in high school. Um, we were wow. rated uh, one of the top teams in Western Pennsylvania in 1969. Uh, interesting. What position did you play, by the way? I played uh, for, I played um, running back and um, cornerback. Well, okay, an athlete as well. I didn't see. I'm learning something new about you in this in this conversation now. But I know, in addition to being a business owner, you also worked for companies along the way. So, would you share with us your your work journey first, and then secondly, I want to you to talk with us about your business journey. My work journey, I started out at uh, General Motors. There was a, a official body at the time was a division of General Motors. We made everything from the windshield back on, on a car. Um, I was the first black employee in the design engineering department. I was recruited out of high school, actually. They had a program where you work in each aspect of the company for, for um, six weeks, and then you go to school for six weeks and over a six year period, you would have, uh, have your degree and you would be able to run uh, an automotive plant. Um, and so I was there for, and that's where I learned about um, building your, look, looking at your life in five-year increments. So in 1969, we were working on 1974 models. So we were always working five years out. And so I took that and then I applied that in my life but I, I worked there for five years and then they went from redesigning cars every year to every five years and they wiped out that division. So from there, I went into the steel industry where um, I worked in the office where I pr produced orders for, for steel. And then they went, uh, went uh, out on strike and so I left the steel industry. And then I worked with a friend of mine and doing masonry construction. We built homes, um, his dad and I, and built a successful business. And then my, my 
my partner embezzled the money and we went, we went bankrupt. Okay. So then from there, I got involved with power transmission, motors, sprockets, gears, conveyors, and I sold uh, the, the equipment that power industry and I, all, all throughout uh, Western Pennsylvania and, and into Virginia, um, built that business up and then uh, was successful, doubled the revenues of the business. And then they got mad because they, I outperformed the contract <laughs> and they didn't want to pay me the money as well. You know, well, we don't need him. So they, they I left got a job as a maintenance former for a company that made sheet fed printing presses. Um, that was a 500 uh, employees we had there. Plant had been around since 1910. Maintenance foreman to plant engineer where I ran the entire plant, had a staff of 32 people. It was a 24 hour operation. Uh, that company got bought by a German company. They took all the work overseas, closed the plant. And then I got involved with uh, uh, computers when they first came out, Commodore 64s, IBM PCs. And I had to retrain myself, learn that business and found that I was telling people how to use the technology to run their businesses. And I write up the proposals and everything and tell them what software they needed. And then they would take that and then go out and buy from somebody else. So I said, okay, so now I develop a consulting business where I would develop the proposal and then they would pay me for that. And then I give it to them and they go buy the equipment. So I ran that business for a number of years. And in the meantime, I met a young guy who was an engineering student at the University of Pittsburgh. His dad had an ad advertising agency and his dad got a contract for the Material Handling Institute, which is anything to do with the movement stores, tracking and retrieval of materials. He says, I need a guy that knows computers and knows industry. And, and his son says, well, I know a guy I used to work with. And he called me, I got with his dad and uh, they hired me. And I was doing business. We took that show, which was a national show, and built that into an international show. And um, then um, the last show that I did, we had 250,000 square feet of exhibit space, 600 exhibitors. We were doing business in 125 countries. Uh, every US consulate in the world, I was writing a newsletter that went out to there. And then I did a video now, this was before the internet that went out across the world, all US cons consulates. And so um, that was going very well. I then managed five of the technical groups that were within the Institute, hoist, crane, monorails, automatic guided vehicle systems, plastic systems. And again, I outperformed the contract and he says, well, you know, if Staten, if he keeps doing this, he's gonna be making more money than the president. So I says, well, I had a better year than the president. What's the, you know, what's the problem? I mean, <laughs> you're mad at me because I'm performing. If I didn't perform, you would fire me. Um, but this is something that I found is common with people, especially in sales, that when you outperform the contract, they don't want to pay. They figure, well, we can get this without him. And so I said, well, if I can make millions of dollars for other people, I could make a couple of million for myself. Mm. And that's really was the journey that I took, if you will, to get me to the point where I end up working and created my own business. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what business did you create? Your first, you know, after, you know as a mature adult? Um, I bought um, I bought an equipment repair company, a guy who was an mm -hmm. ex-IBM typewriter repair uh, guy. And um, so I bought controlling interest of that business. It was struggling on, on the verge of bankruptcy. Um, while I was working, I lived off my base salary and I banked my commissions. Uh, plus I was in, had the 401k to the max. And I had a 15 year mortgage versus a 30 year mortgage. So my house was, was uh, two thirds of my mortgage was paid off. So I only had one quarter left to, to pay my house off. And I took my 401k money. I took the equity in my house and that's the money that I used to finance my business. So it was self-financed. So no one could control me. Um, took that repair business. We, we looked at the banking industry and I looked at the things that the large 
vendors didn't want to do. Well, they didn't want to repair the equipment because their job is to sell machines. If they repair it, then that means in the sell cycle is going to be extended. So I took what I did in industry and I applied that in the white collar world. So I says, I can take the equipment that you have, extend the life of that equipment and guarantee the same performance. So we went from typewriters to copiers, uh, fax machines, money counters, uh, paper shredders, all of the small business equipment. When you go into a bank and you look at the equipment that they're using to, to, to manage that bank, my company did the maintenance. Anytime that equipment broke, we're the people that got called. And mm -hmm. so we started out uh, as, a, as a local company, then we went regional, and then we went um, statewide, and then we went and we were at, uh, up to eight states. Um, the regional banks, uh, BB&T, uh, First Citizens, Wachovia, First Union, which became um, Wells Fargo, and Wachovia uh, became uh, Wells Fargo, um, Bank of America. At one time, at our, at our zenith, we were doing 5,000 branches in, in eight states. And I had the eight wow. direct employees, 70 ind indirect employees. Um, we took and built it into a multi-million dollar business. Hmm. That's that's fantastic. Um, so I, I want to want to go back to because right now you you're a very successful individual. So I want to peek into what you've learned about a few things. For example, what have you learned about adversity and business? Life is problematic, and so you have to be a problem solver. If you are a problem solver, you bring value in any arena that you go into. You're going to bring value. Um, there's, there's no shortage of critics. Hmm. And so in order to make yourself unique, you need to be the person with the solutions. Um, so as you look at any situation, um, I do what I call a SWOT analysis. Hmm. You look at the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats. And when you look at the weaknesses of a business, you come up with solutions to turn that weakness into a strength, and that's your opportunity. Mm. And that's true of any environment that you go into, okay? Mm -hmm. Most people, you know, when I was doing sales, when I, used, when I was doing the industrial sales, and I'm, I was selling sprockets and, and, and pulleys, and so everybody's selling that, and they're trying to sell on price. I go to a guy, and I says, Give me the problems. Give me the things that are causing you to lose sleep at night mm. in your business. And so I said, so let's write these down. We'll write down the top five. So if I can solve those issues, can we do business? And the guy says, yeah. And then I would go and I would pro provide a solution to that problem. I got the mm. business. And mm. They couldn't, the, the people that I was working with, they couldn't figure out how is this guy selling all this stuff? And we've been doing this for 30 years. He comes in here, we're a million dollar business and in 18 months, he brings in a million dollars of new business. Yeah, but um, tell us, how, how, do you, how do you do that? <laughs> how do you do that? <laughs> well, you, you, you're selling solutions. Uh -huh. And so it, you go and you look, people, everybody has problems, right? Very few people and everybody is concerned about their problems. So as a salesperson, you want to be the person who provides solutions to their problems. If you do that, you create value. Mm. Mm -hmm. I see. I want to go back to something else that you said that I didn't jump on it immediately. You mentioned that you were working and you lived off of your base salary and you did something else with your additional earnings. Um, where did that, and kind of tell us again what you may mean by that, but where did that insight come from? Was it something that you read in a book or? You know, no, that came, that came from my dad. And my dad mm -hmm. came from the segregated South um, under Jim Crow laws. And he was a sharecropper and the system was set up to keep you in perpetual poverty. And so he learned and it's something he told me, he says, control your money and you will have control of your life. And so he was a saver and he taught, taught us to save 15% of every dollar you make. 
You know, I don't care mm. how much, what your gross is, whatever you get, you set aside 15% minimum. So that in turn, because at that time, banks wouldn't loan you any money. Um, insurance, and, and you couldn't, if you were black, you couldn't get any more than $10,000 worth of life insurance. So the system was structured to keep you in poverty. And so he figured out a way to control his life. And because of that, he taught all of us. I have, uh, there was nine kids. All of us have had a mi middle-class lifestyle and above. All of us have been homeowners. Um, some of us have, um, uh, all of us graduated from high school. So education and savings were key things that allows you to control your life, all right? And by, and again, then getting a 15 year mortgage versus a 30 year mortgage, you get the, you can afford the 15 year mortgage by not tying up money in cars. You drive older vehicles. Mm -hmm. You know, I never pay retail for a car. And, and um, you know, I would buy, uh, even with my business, I would buy old people's cars, right? Um, and the car may be 10, uh, 10, let's say the car is 10 years old and it's got 100,000 miles on it. You take that car, take it to the dealer and get 100,000 miles service on it. So they'll replace all the consumables, consumables on the vehicle, the, the hoses, the belts, uh, the gaskets, they'll flush out all the fluids. And then that car is good for another 100,000 miles. Hmm. and you have no car payment, right? Yeah. So if you don't have a car payment, now you can afford the extra money for that 15-year mortgage. Well, the other thing that happens as you're paying off your, your home, you have equity. When you have equity in your home, you can always get money. Even if you don't have a job, they'll give you money on the equity of your home. So hmm. that in turn allows you, when you have the ups and downs, you can recover. Mm -hmm. And all of wow. this is self-finance. So, and I would never deny myself a loan. Mm. Wow. Look, you've mentioned your father a couple of times, and I'm just curious. I'm not sure if he shared this with you, but where did he get his insights from? Because he gave you all some powerful lessons. He just was a visionary. I, 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 I asked him, you know, I says, when you were a sharecropper and you're walking behind a mule, and you got no money, you're working from sun up to sundown six days a week. He says, I used to see business people driving down the road and they had those big Cadillacs and, and they were always dressed in nice suits and so forth. He says, that's what I'm gonna do, mm -hmm. right? Under those severe circumstances, he had vision, he, that was his dream. And he, that is what drove him. Before he was 50 years old, he was debt free and owned three homes. Wow. Okay. Um, and you know, he, he went to Pittsburgh, uh, got a room, got a job, and he sent money back to take care of my mother and my brother and sister for three years. And then he brought them up and then he bought a duplex. We lived in one side and he rented out the other, the rent paid the mortgage on that. And then once we got to a certain level, then he bought a house and the rent from those two units paid the mortgage on the house. So before he was 50, he was debt free. Uh, this is the guy that never made more than $38,000 a year and he died and left an estate worth $200,000. Wow, whoa. That's, that says a lot. So how do you think middle-aged people uh, you know, in the United States, to be specific, are doing with this, with savings today? How do you think we're doing? Absolutely terrible. Most people, mm -hmm. if they had a crisis, irrespective of how much money they make, they would be hard pressed to come up with $400 cash. Wow. Ooh. And you know the average family of four, they say middle class is sixty thousand a year. You got people making sixty thousand dollars a year, and if they had a crisis, they they would be hard pressed to come up with four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. What do you think is responsible for that? Is it just? I mean, do we just don't save, or is there more more to it? Than well, that? I mean, it's it's by design. I mean, corporations are in business to make money, and they look at us as sheep to be shorn. So, <laughs> right. 
24 seven, we're getting messages, buy, 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 you need, if you don't have this, if you drive this kind of car, then this is how you're gonna be viewed. If you wear this kind of clothing, then this is who you are. If you wear these kind of shoes, this says, so poor people dress and consume like they're rich. And that's why they stay poor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. I mean, <clears throat> clearly, um, as I've you know reviewed your your work and your service, dreaming or dreams are important to you. Do you recall at what stage you began to dream of more for yourself? Four or five years old. You know, like oh, I said, well, I, that early? Yeah. yeah, I mean, I used to watch those programs, man. I, you know, I, I, man, I'm looking at how business people live. That's the mm. life, you know, and mm. that's what I want. Hmm. Wow. So, okay, what have you learned about, and there's a lot of writing today, people are talking about mindset. How do you view mindset, and is that important in a person achieving success in whatever endeavor they are pursuing? Mindset is critical. Um, I, I work, there's 23 schools out here in the Los Angeles area that have, have an entrepreneurial, um, entrepreneurship as a part of their curriculum. And so I've been working with these schools for the last uh, eight years. And I talked to them about what I call the 5-5 program. Hmm. Five years from now, what is your life going to look like? And if you make that decision at 15, you know what you're going to be doing when you're 20, and you know what you need to do to get there. So most people, and, and I asked them, I says, not five minutes, not five days, not five months, five years from now, where do you want to be? When you make that big decision, then that aligns all the small decisions. That's going to determine if you decide that, that you want to be, um, an electrical engineer, right? Well, then as a freshman, that's you need to get with your guidance counselor and says, I wanna be an electrical engineer, right? So we're gonna tell you, or here's the courses that you need to take. And you wanna take as many courses as possible in high school because you're not paying for that. Now, if you decide that once you graduate, well, you may find that there's a number of courses that you got to go and take in order to qualify for that. And you're now you're paying for that. So you make that decision as a freshman, right? If you decide that you want to be um, a plumber, then you need to take a look at, okay, what courses do I need to take? How much math do I need in order to be a plumber? Whatever it is, project out five years, Make that in you, that's your dream, that's your mindset. And then anything that is taking you towards that goal, that's what you do. Anything or anyone that is taking you away from that goal, they don't get any of your time. So that makes you more efficient also. Hmm. I like it, I like it. Now, um, you know, some people when they look at the landscape today, they would say, look, you know, we've just gone through and still going through a COVID-19. You know, opportunities are limited, including places like the United States. How do you see opportunities today? Are we, are we short of opportunities for people? This, there's more opportunity today than ever before. Uh, this, in this country, uh, especially um, um, for those who have been denied access to education, this is the most educated group of Americans in the history of this country. And so by virtue of education, and, and then you add on top of that, you got the internet now. There's virtually, I can't think of a subject for which there isn't detailed information available on the internet. So there's never been access to info, more access to information than, ever, than, than before. So by virtue of determining, again, what service can I provide that is going to be needed on a repetitive basis. And that's your opportunity. Hmm. Okay, so you know, you've done it over, over a lifetime almost. Um, if you were starting today from scratch, James, uh, could you do it again? If you were starting from scratch, could you do oh, it Oh, absolutely. Now? Yeah, I, I, in fact, there's more opportunities now <laughs> than 
I'm 72 years old. I just don't have the energy. I have the intellect. I have the, I have the, the, the knowledge. I have the experience. I don't have the energy. Um, and one time when I was doing the trade shows, I was traveling all over North America and I had agents working for me all across the world. Um, and so I spent a lot of time in airports and a lot of time in hotels. I don't have that kind of energy anymore. However, I have access to the internet and I can do business uh, virtually. And so there's training and so forth that I do. Um, there's videos, I have two videos that, that are on uh, YouTube and um, I'm writing a book. Uh, and and um, so there, those are the opportunities. So I can take the information that I have and package that information to solve problems. And that in turn creates an opportunity which brings value and so I'm still making money. Wow. That's a, yeah, that says a lot. So you've talked about community wealth. Um, if I got that right, what do you mean when you share on the subject of community wealth? I mean where you learn how to make the money, you learn how to save the money, you learn how to make the money work for you instead of you working for the money. And then you learn how to pass that money on to the next generation. And so you have to think generationally. Uh, decisions that I made in my, uh, I have two kids. Uh, my son will be 50, my daughter 47. Um, I was married um, for 15 years to her mother and she got uh, breast cancer at 30. We fought that for five years. Uh, we beat it. And then she got a, a, a cancerous brain tumor and it killed her. So I was widowed mm. at, at 30, 36. Mm. Um, I had uh, two kids, 12 and uh, 10 and 12. And uh, now I still have my goals, my dreams, but now you have all the stuff, all the things that, that you wanted and we built this together and now my partner's gone. So how do you reset? Well, I'm mm -hmm. 36 years old. I still got a lot of living to do and I got two kids to raise. Mm -hmm. So my goal when I kids were born, my son and a daughter, and again, I plan for my children. I plan for my son, I plan for my daughter. We spaced them out. All of that was intentional. And mm -hmm. so I had goals and dreams for them. And so now I'm like, okay, I need a partner to help me continue on the rest of, of my quest, if you will. And I came up with um, a list of what are, again, I did my SWOT analysis. What are my strengths? What are my weaknesses? What opportunities? What threats? And I had that mental list and I'm looking for a woman that my weaknesses are her strengths. And so uh, now my current wife, we've been married 34 years now, and she says she still feels like she was on a job interview when I first. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, OK, what's your five year plan? All right. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do you feel? You know, what, what are your goals, your dreams, your aspirations? How do you feel about money? Are you a saver or are you a spender? How do, do you pay all your credit cards off every month or do you carry them over and make the minimum payments? What's your view of money? Um, mm -hmm. What um, are are you, are you uh, physically, you know, do, do you work out? You know, do you, do you walk, do you exercise or are you a couch potato, all right? Um, do you want children or not, okay? Um, so five areas of life, I look at, uh, okay, she answers, I'm, so I'm, I'm going now, okay, she, but she checked them all off. I says, okay, there's no need for me to look any further. Wow, whoo. Man, you need to write about that. <laughs> that's, that's, a good one. That's, that's really a good one. Yeah, you know, I, I also want you to share because you've talked also about cradle to wealth. And when I saw that, well, that's, you know, I, I don't think too many people talk about that. So where did this come from? And, and what are you trying to share with, with the public when you talk about that? Well, I, um, again, thinking generationally. So I, I tell kids, I says, the most unloving thing that you can do is to bring a child into this world without a plan for their success. So before you even make a baby, 
have a plan for their success. You're going to bring this child into the world. What kind of environment are you going to bring them into? Are you do you know? Before I got married, uh, I had two cars. I had an apartment that was totally furnished. I had six months income in the bank. Hmm. Um, and then we spent the first year just getting to know each other and traveling and doing things together. We were totally selfish getting to know each other. And then now that we're on the same page, now we'll 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 have our first first baby. And I told people, I said, I'm gonna have a son and then we're gonna have a daughter. And they said, man, you can't, you can't say that, right? <laughs> so we had a son, two years later, we had a daughter. <laughs> you got you got lucky, you got lucky. <laughs> uh, that's, that's, but, that's something, yeah. But mindset, right? Yeah. So before you make a baby, have a plan for their success, you know, uh, prepare for that. Uh, it, it, and especially today with all the birth control that's out here, it's just astounding to me that people are having babies with no plan. Oh, uh, it was an accident. Yeah. You're dealing with life here, right? And so, and, and this, is, this is the foundation. The family is the foundation for our nation. And marriage has to be, that's, 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 that's the cornerstone of our civilization. This is where you know you bring children into this, you socialize them, you give them structure, you give them accountability, responsibility, you, <laughs> you exemplify that by your conduct. And now you're raising law-abiding citizens who are gonna be productive, who in turn, as we get older, they're gonna be able to take care of us. If we have all these children who do not have that, then as we get older, we're going to have fewer people working and the whole system will collapse. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, many of us, James, you know, didn't have the insights that you had when you were five years old. And we have not started to do the kinds of things that you talk about. My question is, do you, when is it too late? I mean, you know, of course, it's too late if you are on your deathbed, but when is it too late for us? It's too late when the lights go out. All right. So, yeah. You should be, I, I recommend what I call, every human being should be on uh, a continuous improvement program that every day you should be learning. Uh, you should be expanding on what you have. I still get uh, a word of the day. The average person they say has a vocabulary of about 40,000 uh, words. Um, if you add one word a day, that's 365 words that you add to your vocabulary. And then if you learn the synonyms for those words, you double that. Mm -hmm. And the more words you have, the greater your ability to process information. Mm -hmm. And that's so again, when you have your plan, then you're going to become the subject expert on it, where it is that you want to get to, and you are continuously taking in more information. That in turn puts you in a position where you can solve problems and that's where you bring value. That's your value proposition. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, wow, that's very good. I want to go back to a few things that you've, you've written about this and you've talked about it so you know earlier in our conversation and that is the passing of your first wife. And I, I want to, I know, I hope you don't mind me asking, but how do you, how does a person overcome such a traumatic, how did you overcome such a traumatic event or do you overcome it? Um, you never fully overcome it. You have a hole in your soul. You, you just learn how, how to go forward. And the primary thing that got me through that is focusing on others, I'm focusing on my son, focusing on my daughter. Um, as I said, I have, um, brothers and sisters, and I live a life of, of service. And so uh, in, in serving others and focusing on them, you don't have time to feel sorry for yourself. Uh, and the accomplishing the goals and dreams, uh, not only is that satisfying to me as an individual, but it's satisfying because now I can do things for other people. Um, when, when I was broke, I, I couldn't help anybody, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, but when you when when you're in a position where you have five years income in the bank liquid, 
you can do things. You can you can affect change. You know, I mean, you, you, you know, I have uh, friends that a guy that uh, had a towel business and and he, he uh, hardworking guy and he, he had neuropathy. He stepped on a nail, didn't know it, and so he couldn't work for several months, and he was going to lose his home. So you know, my wife and I we paid his mortgage for three months. Broke wow. people can't do that. When I was broke, I couldn't do that. <laughs> okay. Right. right. Um, you know, I have people, uh, five of my eight employees became first time homeowners. And again, I gave my employees, all of my employees were provided a vehicle at company expense. So since they didn't, and all the expenses for the vehicle, my company took care of that for them as long as they, they perform. So you do your job. I'm going to eliminate your automotive expense. And again, I bought them new vehicles. And um, now you get a 15 year mortgage, right? And so by, by doing that and by saving money, they in turn were able to be debt free by the time they were in their mid forties. I couldn't do that when I was broke. Yeah. You see, yeah. so there's yeah. things that you can do when you have capital beyond your needs mm -hmm. that, um, yeah. And that's where the real joy comes in. Joy isn't about the stuff that you have. And I've, I've had the stuff. I mean, I, I my, my, my wife, uh, my second wife, Gail, uh, I bought her a BMW for our anniversary. And every three years, I would buy her another BMW or a Mercedes. Or, um, and so we've had this stuff, right? Uh, and I enjoyed it. But the things that are most important to me are the things that I was able to do to serve other people. Right. Yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, people, what, what do you say to someone who says, oh, money's not important. Money's not important. I'm sure you've heard that. Yes. Yeah. And the people that said that are broke. <laughs> You're right. And they're turning to someone like you to, to, get, to get some money because yeah. we, all, uh, we, all, we all need it. Yeah. Well, I tell them money uh, is a tool. It's, it's like a hammer. It can be used to build. It can be used to tear up. Uh, mm -hmm. Money doesn't define who you are, but mm -hmm. money is a tool. And in a capitalistic system, you must have capital. Mm -hmm. That's right. So, look, you've, you know, family is huge with you. You know, you've mentioned your children, you know, your current wife, and you've written about this. So, I want to ask you about compassion. Um, so, do you have compassion? Well, I hope that you don't mind me asking, but it's, it's occurring to me. Uh, or people who, for example, were not as successful as you in in marriage, who have made mistakes or, or have divorces. How do you how do you talk with these people? You know? I talk to them about the nine to seven principles. Okay. And the nine to seven principles are based on agape love, principle love. Mm -hmm. So there's nine things that agape love is not, and then there's seven things that it is. And if you use these principles, you're going to make good decisions. And so what it is not jealous, doesn't brag, doesn't get puffed up, doesn't behave rudely or indecently, does not look for its own interests, does not become angry, does not keep account of injury or hold grudges. It doesn't glorify wrongdoing or criminal behavior. It never fails because it's timeless. Now, what it is, is patient, it's kind, it's truthful. It bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, it endures all things. Those are the principles that I use for making decisions. And that's what I recommend to everyone. And no one that has applied these principles in their life has come back and says, you know, you really screwed up my life. In wow. every case, it has improved the quality of their life because they make better decisions. Mm -hmm. That's that's fantastic. Look, I need a list of those of what you've just said because I want to put them. People will hear it, but I want them to see it in the show notes as well. So I'll talk with you about that later. That's that's just wonderful. Yeah. Very so, good. Look, uh, yeah, well, I've asked you a ton of questions. Any parting words uh, that you want to share that I have not asked you? Well, I, I would tell people. If a person is not in a life where you want to be, they can't tell you how to get there. Mm -hmm. 
And there's nothing more abundant than broke advice. Mm. And people are very free with their opinions. Um, you got to decide what it is that you want out of life and, and um, be a, a servant leader. Look to serve. And when you serve others and help them get what they want, you will get what you want and everybody wins. Mm. I love it. Everyone winning. That's, that's great. Well, James, it certainly has been a pleasure uh, talking with you today. Thank you so much for accepting my invitation to be on my podcast. It is my pleasure. And um, again, I appreciate what you're doing. Again, you're bringing value. Yeah. You're sharing information that people otherwise would not get that, that will be beneficial to them. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Well, you have been listening to the Possibility Action Network podcast. Our, ho our guest today has been James Statton Jr. I'm your host, Stephen Middleton. Until next time, good day.